But today we have a real uh, special guest. He is uh, Dr. William Lee. He's a physician, a scientist. He's the president and medical director of the Angiogenesis Foundation. He's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Eat to Beat Disease, The New Science of How Your Body Can Heal Itself. And uh, it's a real honor to have Dr. Lee with us. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, uh, David and Tucker. Nice to be on. Very good. It's an honor to meet you. And for our listening audience, we have Tucker Goodrich with us, who's our friend and uh, the proprietor of the blog, yelling-stop.blogspot.com. And we're looking forward to an interesting and informative discussion today. Well, I'm I'm happy to talk about uh, uh, this whole broad topic about how do we actually take our own responsibilities and opportunities to improve our health. Yeah. I uh, a lot of uh, particular some of the topics that I've heard uh, from listeners interested in your work is related to your work in cancer. And that's your background, isn't it? In studying and developing drugs for cancer. Yeah. So I'm a physician, internal medicine doctor, which means that I take care of young and old men and women, uh, healthy and sick. And my own uh, my own personal orientation as a doctor has always been to try to keep people healthy. And when they sort of slip off the roof and get sick, my goal has been always to return people back to health as opposed to just continuously treat and chase sickness. And I'm also a research scientist. I'm what you call a vascular biologist. So I study blood vessels and blood vessels are actually, um, they're the highways and byways for our health because it brings oxygen and the nutrients that we eat from our food to every single cell in our body. And because my background was in this field called angiogenesis, which is how the body grows blood vessels. So it's 60,000 mile channels that are inside our bodies. Um, I uh, naturally wound up looking at cancer because it turns out that this feared disease, cancer, that you know brings a like a, a, a natural uh, negative response, like fearful response. And every time it's the word is even said, turns out that we all form cancers in our bodies all the time, like from the time we we're children. And the reason is our the human body is uh, this miraculous construction of about 40 trillion cells. These are tiny little pieces that make us up. And in order for us to stay alive, these cells have to divide. And every time they divide, they have to do it perfectly. But 40 trillion perfect moves is really hard to do. So anytime there's a mistake or two, which happens every day, actually 10,000 times a day, um, that turns into a mutation. That mutation, if it actually is left unchecked, can turn into a microscopic cancer. But microscopic cancers are not harmful at all. They're like pimples that form in our backs. We won't even know that they're there. And what happens with cancer is that they can't grow without a blood supply, angiogenesis. And that's how I got involved with cancer research. How do we cut off the blood supply um, to cancers? How do we prevent blood vessels from growing so that they don't ever become dangerous? And that's an interesting topic. Uh, We've interviewed some folks uh, in cancer research, uh, folks like... uh, Dr. Michael Lasanti from Salford University and uh, Dr. Thomas Seyfried from Boston College, both of whom have basically suggested that cancer is primarily a metabolic disease rather than what we used to think of it as primarily a a disease of genetic uh, mutations driving it. Where do you land on that topic? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, you're actually summarizing a real fact that we have today, which is only, you know, we hear all this about genetic testing for cancer and get your BRCA screen. Those are all really important. And if you have a family history, you should see if you have a genetic link, but in truth, only five to 10%, probably closer to 5% of cancers are genetically caused. So that means 95% of it is due to the exposures we have, our diet, our lifestyle, our life experiences, frankly, some of which we control as adults, some of which we don't control because our parents controlled it for us. And so this really kind of ties together this whole idea that, you know, as humans, we have this entire life cycle where what we're exposed to during our time in this, uh, you know, on the planet actually can make a big difference on whether or not we're going to stay well or get sick. I see. So, which is why, of course, we've seen these the rise in all of these diseases that you described so well in your in your work, like cancer, um, breast cancer. I mean, one of the one of the most fascinating studies I've ever seen was looking at breast cancer in 
Asian immigrants to the United States and how the cancer rate goes up dramatically over a couple of generations, which of course their genes aren't changing. So it's got to be something that they're doing wrong, one could say, once they get here to the United States. It's fascinating okay. how this can impact can impact yeah, one's health. It's all about exposure, right? I mean, basically we have, I mean, think about it first in a good way rather than a bad way. Uh, most of us are um, uh, fortunate enough to have really great experiences in our lives. It may not be every experience we have that's great, but all of us can remember one or two amazing times that we've had that's based on a life experience or a life exposure. And what we pay less attention to as we navigate, you know, sort of our nine to five world is what are some of the harms that might be lurking in the background? Right. So if you think about it, when you go to the beach um, in Florida or wherever, um, uh, it's wonderful to be, you know, out in the water. What a refreshing opportunity to to be, you know, in the sea. That's one of my favorite things. But, you know, there are dangers that are lurking there and we don't pay attention to the jellyfish, the sharks, the moray eels and the other things and the red tides that actually occur. And so similarly, as we go through life, you know, there are these dangers that we should that science is teaching us to be more aware of and, and, and the opportunity for us to counter. And that's really what I wanna say. We can all make decisions based on what we know now to counter the harms that, we, um, uh, that, that are, part of our are, are part of our daily lives. We can't ask for a perfect life on this planet. What we can ask for is enough awareness to make better decisions to counter those harms that we may encounter. That, we, that may confront us, and also to be able to navigate and make better choices all along the way. So, you know, Nixon declared war on cancer in the 1960s, and it seems like we've, uh, over the last hundred years, cancer has been going through the roof compared to what we could see from past uh, eras, uh, from whatever we could measure in terms of cancer rates in the previous era of the last century, before the last century, really. What, why do you think that we've seen these skyrocketing rates of cancer? It's obviously some kind of environmental effect, right? Something we're doing to ourselves that we didn't do before. What would that be? Yeah, well, so let's take a look at the time frame that you're, that you're describing. So the war on cancer was declared by Richard Nixon in 1971. In mm -hmm. fact, I gave a, I, I was on a panel at celebrating the, uh, uh, the uh, 50th anniversary of the National Cancer Act that President Nixon passed. And it is true compared to the mid 20th century, I would say there has been a skyrocketing, like a hockey stick going up of rates of certain types of cancer. But on the other hand, if you take a look at the last 20 years of those 50 years, we've actually seen a tapering off, a leveling off of, of, of cancer deaths, partly because we actually have enough awareness now to know that smoking isn't good for you. We've actually tried to encourage people to wear sunscreen. Um, there's a, uh, uh, we know that um, smoking is, uh, is a big trigger for lung cancer. And so there have been some public health measures, not enough yet, but there have been some that have actually started to taper off and sort of level the curve a bit in some of the cancers. What's even more remarkable though, I would say David and, and, and Tucker, is the fact that we, uh, cancer is no longer this amorphous blob, you know, that we don't know how to deal with turns out that we've been able to use the modern scientific methods to break down cancer into its elementary parts. And when we realize it's, it's metabolism, but not only metabolism, it's the blood supply that feeds cancer, but not only the blood supply, it's the, our immune system that needs to wipe it out and get rid of that inflammation, but not only the immune system and not only inflammation, we've been able to actually essentially um, assemble the thousand piece puzzle uh, that is the is cancer. So think about the Sistine Chapel as a thousand piece puzzle. We don't have all the pieces together yet, but we have a lot of the pieces. And some of the most remarkable breakthroughs for cancer treatment has occurred in harnessing the body's own ability to be able to cut off the blood supply to cancer, to be able to ratchet up our immune system, to wipe out cancer. I mean, these things have been game changers for uh, cancer patients. And also to be able to use diet and nutrition to be able to alter our risk and also to be able to make cancer treatments work better. Right, but you're not focused. I mean, angiogenesis is a fascinating topic as a vascular scientist. Obviously, it's not just affecting cancer. It's affecting a variety of these different uh, chronic diseases, Western diseases, whatever term you want to use to describe the modern pandemics. Um, 
Talk to us a little bit about how uh, you mentioned macular, age-related macular degeneration in your body, which is a disease of excessive angiogenesis, if I understand it correctly, and is often treated by blocking something that causes uh, vascular growth. Yes, exactly. Well, look, so the first thing to know for all of your viewers and listeners is that blood vessels are absolutely critical for health. We just need to have the right amount. Too few blood vessels, insufficient angiogenesis, not enough circulation, leads to problems in our organs, like a blockage in our heart vessels leads to, can, you know, can triggers a heart attack. <clears throat> On the other hand, and so there's many conditions where you want to kind of prop up and grow and nurture more blood vessels to feed your healthy organs. On the other hand, too many blood vessels can be catastrophic like feeding cancer, um, uh, as, we just, as we just briefly described, or uh, if they grow where they're not supposed to. And this is the critical thing in the eye, right? After the age of about 40 or 50, all of us become much more vulnerable to deterioration of our eyesight. And it's not just cataracts, not just nearsightedness or farsightedness, but in fact, at the very back of the eye, okay, the part that we can't see in the mirror, there is an area called the retina. The retina is covered with a carpet of nerve cells that receive the light that comes in through the front of our eye. And, and, and in order for the light to go from the front to the back of the eye, from the front to the back, you actually have to have crystal clear water. So think about, you know, the Caribbean Sea. You can see right down to the bottom. You can see the coral reef. You can see the fish swimming around. Think about, you know, like a, like a, um, uh, a, a, a stormy sea where the sand is churned up. You can't see anything. Okay. So um, blood vessels growing in the eye have to be really normally controlled. I needs blood vessels too, needs oxygen, needs nutrients, but they keep them so tightly controlled so that it can, so the fluid in the, in the eye can be crystal clear. When extra blood vessels grow, particularly when they grow, don't grow in a stable fashion, um, what they do is they leak. They leak fluid. They leak blood. They can bleed. And when blood starts to seep out into that crystal clear, crystalline water, that Caribbean uh, beach water, okay, um, all of a sudden you can no longer see because the light can't get through to the back of the eye. So most common cause of vision loss over the age of 60 in America is age-related macular degeneration. What happens is you have a degeneration of the nerves, that carpet of nerves starts to kind of not be kind of sickly, but then when blood vessels start growing, that is really the signal to the end of your vision. So uh, out of the work that I've done, and I've, I started doing this in the mid-1980s, is desperately look <clears throat> for ways that we can intercept those blood vessels and prevent them from growing and bleeding and leaking. And so um, this whole idea of when you said targeting blood vessel growth, I, I was very impressed that, that you actually summarized that. Um, there's a protein that's a fertilizer for blood vessels called VEGF. And now we know other ones that can contribute they're called like angiopoietins too. And these- Vascular these, endothelial growth, growth vascular factor. Vascular endothelial for the growth factor. I'm listeners. doubly impressed that you know that. Okay, so VEGF, as, as we call it, um, actually is a protein that in macular degeneration, these abnormal, the sickly retina actually starts releasing this protein to grow blood vessels. And when the blood vessels grow, they leak. Now, what we're doing is treating people with uh, uh, biotech medicines that can stop those blood vessels from growing, halt them in their tracks. And actually in about 30% of people, you can actually get some form of re reversal of vision loss. So you, I've had a patient who, by the way, who was completely blind, couldn't read, couldn't see. Her favorite thing was playing golf. Okay. And it was a big bummer to her that standing up and she was kind of tall. She could not see the golf ball. And we got her, uh, she was one of the first people to get these anti-VEGF or anti-blood vessel growing uh, uh, treatments in, uh, into her eye. And I got a call from her uh, about three weeks after she started her treatments. And she said, hey, doc, guess where I'm calling you from? I'm calling you from the golf course. And I just played 10 holes. And she was so happy. And so these are breakthroughs that are actually happening. The science that's led to those breakthroughs, okay, um, not only for macular degeneration, but for cancer and other diseases as well, is now being translated away from only the hospital, only the doctor, only the pharmaceutical companies, over now to the farmer's market and to the gardens, because that's one of the things that I write about in my book, Eat to Beat Disease. If um, biotech medicines are actually uh, uh, working because of the power of the science, 
could we use the science, the same science, to look at foods to see how they could actually benefit us? And that's what I've been doing for the last decade is testing foods as medicine in the same systems that drugs are developed. And so people talk about food as medicine all the time and sort of in the hand wavy sort of way. I'm one of those guys that actually does it. And um, I can tell you that it's quite spectacular what we're discovering. Some medicines can go head to head against drugs. Some of them beat the drugs even in terms of uh, their power. Right. Yeah, I'm uh, a former patient who got over a bunch of diseases that some of which you mentioned in your book, uh, irritable bowel disease through uh, fixing with diet. So that's kind of what got my interest in this topic because it wasn't something that was supposed to happen that way, you know, either getting sick in the first place or then getting healthy uh, 10 odd years ago. And, uh, you know, not, not needing regular doctor or hospital visits was quite a nice change to see in my life. So we're, they, you know, we're a huge fan of the idea of fixing um, health conditions with diet. Um, yeah, we actually have a mutual friend, uh, Tucker and I have Chris, uh, Dr. Chris Kenobi, who's an ophthalmologist. <laughs> yeah, and he created a foundation called Cure AMD, and he, he primarily identifies the uh, rise in consumption of omega-6 vegetable oil fats. Would you say, Chris, uh, uh, Tucker, is his kind of premise for what's causing adult onset. Well, it's, it's, it's his premise and it's a common theme in the literature in that area that there seems to be a pathway from excessive, call it omega-6 consumption to uh, VEGF production, production to AMD incidents. And that's, you know, in your, in your book, Dr. Lee, that's a very interesting kind of undertone. Um, you discuss the benefits of omega three fats, you caution against eating tilapia because it has too much omega-6 fats and you caution against cooking with, well, you don't, you caution that one should fry with uh, olive oil and which of course has less omega-6 fats, but you don't really get directly into that topic, um, which is a particular interest of mine, the pro and negative effects of omega-6 fats. So perhaps you could just go, go into a little bit about you know, your thoughts behind cautioning against, um, you know, both the obvious benefits of omega-3 fats and your cautions against uh, too much omega-6 fats. Yeah, well, so let me kind of frame this out maybe for your listeners and viewers. One of the things to recognize is that the body is quite remarkably designed to be able to process all kinds of good things and all kinds of junk that comes into our body. So most of the time we're able to overcome pretty much whatever's thrown at us. And, and this is why kids do so well in general. You know, they, they can go around and eat junk food and all kinds of stuff and they, they don't get that terribly sick early on, but it does leave an imprint in your body that can actually last into your adult years. As we get to be older, our bodies become much less resilient just as a matter of, of, of mm -hmm. aging. Uh, and this is where the, uh, the balance that I'm talking about, being able to kind of contend with both good and bad starts to become a little bit more fragile. When it comes to oils, you know, one of the things that I always tell people is that, look, um, fat, uh, dietary fats, fat itself in our body is critical for life. I'm actually writing my next book about this whole topic. Um, it's critical for metabolism. Our body fat is actually an endocrine organ. It releases hormones that control our brain. In fact, if we didn't have body fat, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. We, we'd all be dead. And so the fact of the matter is, is that that um, we need to consume fat from our diet as well. In the industrialized food era, we are surrounded by abundance. And it's really an, an abundance of, of any one fat, for example, but also abundance of choices. And this is where it gets, starts to get confusing for people. What oils do we choose? Which ones are good? You know, should we fry with them? Should we saute? How much should we use? This whole idea of having too much choice in a way is the um, I would say the, the slippery slope to making bad decisions. So we know, for example, for omega-3, omegas, okay, this is actually describing the chemical structure of fatty acids. Cooking is, tastes much better when you use at least a little bit of oil, whether it's butter, lard, um, whether it's olive oil. I mean, it tastes better, but the question, but the stuff- And it also, is, also has benefits in absorbing fatty acids uh, Fatty, fat-soluble fat vitamins from vegetables, for instance. 
Exactly. Exactly. Great example by of that, and we'll come back to the omega three and omega sixes. Is tomatoes. So tomatoes have uh, lots of carotenoids. These are the things that give tomato its red, cherry red color, yellow and orange color as well, and and lycopene which is one of them has been shown to lower the risk of prostate cancer and even breast cancer, but not in the form that when you pick the tomato off the vine and eat it like an apple or cut it up into a salad as raw tomato, tastes great, that's a great source of vitamin C, but the lycopene, not that well available uh, as mother nature presents it. So how do you make it available? You slowly heat it up uh, in a pan and you kind of create a tomato sauce with it. But lycopene, uh, so the heat would change it into a form your body loves, avidly absorbs. But, to, but lycopene is also fat soluble. So to get more absorbed into your body, into your bloodstream, you want to put a little bit of olive oil in it. Now you've got the lycopene in its right form, swimming in the olive oil. When you eat that lovely tomato sauce, for example, um, it then is very readily absorbed into your bloodstream. And so fats are actually not harmful by themselves, um, but we're starting to realize that when it comes to some certain types of even healthy fats, um, let's look at seafood for a second. Omega threes, omega sixes, they're they're present. Okay, it's a it's a alphabet soup of omegas uh, in terms of fat. But we do know omega threes are healthy, but sometimes they are accompanied by omega sixes, and omega sixes turn out to be pro-inflammatory, which is what we don't want in our body. Mm -hmm. When you when omega sixes are in our body, it stokes inflammation. What is inflammation? Inflammation is basically um, our body's natural response to injury. If you cut yourself, uh, scrape your knee, fall off a bike or a skateboard or whatever, um, you know, that, that redness around that injury or around the paper cut, you get turns a little red, uh, irritated, uh, itchy, maybe even a little bit. That is actually inflammation going on to clean out any bacteria and to, to clean up the, the wound, for example. But Which in that context is, of course, a good thing which is a good thing. And then it goes away. All right. right. And that's why, uh, but in inflammatory bowel disease in rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis. So, so many of these chronic inflammatory and even autoimmune conditions, it's the inflammation that doesn't go away. So it's think about it like the campfire that you really enjoy for a short period of time, you know, when you're out camping. All right. And then when it's bedtime, you put out the fire and then you go into your camper and sleep or whatever your tent. Okay. But imagine the campfire doesn't go out. And at night, it roars on, it comes out of the camp, uh, uh, out of your fire pit, and it starts to get into the woods. And now it's a chronic fire that gets bigger and bigger. That's yeah, well, here, here in Idaho, we have more than our fair share of forest fires going on. It's a very apt analogy. And that's chronic inflammation. Imagine a forest fire burning through your body, okay? And, and, and it, it really upsets the ecosystem of health, just like a forest fire would be, you know, in, in the land uh, in where, where you are at. And, and so what you want to do is avoid fats like omega-6s that are in excess uh, that actually would then drive and spark that forest fire. So omega-6 is like the gasoline, putting petrol into a forest fire. It'll make it roar even more. Omega-3s, by, by contrast, actually start to put out the fire. They're the can of water that you could put onto the onto the fire, you know, into the fire pit to put it out before you go to sleep. And there's other benefits as well uh, to omega three. So I, you know, I always say um, uh, omega three omega threes are good. Omega sixes, you have to be careful. Try to cut down or cut them out. Right now, that's interesting, and that's I mean, one of the great points of your book uh, was the concept of balance. Um, a lot of the, just from my reading, a lot of the diseases that you're describing ultimately come down to diseases of dysregulation. For instance, angiogenesis, per perfectly natural process. You need it in your body to heal from wounds as you describe in your book. Um, and really when it becomes problematic is when it gets out of balance, when it's dysregulated. Is that fair? Is that a fair, dis that is fair summation? That's a, that's a great summary. I'm, I'm so impressed with your, um, you, you've got like the basic concepts down. Uh, and, and so this idea of balance is, you know, there's a scientific term scientists call what happens in the body homeostasis, which is, you know, that steady state of balance, not too much, not too little, not too. Uh, it, so think about balance. We see it in our lives all the time, right? So for any of you listeners, I mean, you're in the car, you're turning on the radio, the volume button is too loud. You got to turn it down. 
not loud enough, you got to turn it up a little bit. That's how our body's set points are. We were kind of looking for that balance. Our mm -hmm. body's incredible in terms of regulating that. In fact, I call it the Goldilocks zone of biology for like all of our systems, our defense, our health defense systems in our body. There's five of them I write about. Angiogenesis is one of them. It operates in what I call the Goldilocks zone. So remember Goldilocks and the three bears. The bears busted into the house and they are looking for places to sit and things to eat and, be and beds to sleep in. Not too hard, not too soft, not too hot, not too cold, just right is what everybody's looking for. And that's what our body naturally looks for, that balance between just right. It doesn't have to be the same all the time, but it's got to op operate within a zone of comfort. And when it, we put, get pushed off that zone of comfort, that's when all the problems happen. And that's where um, that can happen if we're not paying attention uh, to our diet and lifestyle. And yet at the same time, this is where food is a tool in a toolbox that we can actually help our body restore balance. Too much inflammation, let's eat some foods that are anti-inflammatory. Not enough blood vessels, let's eat some foods that can help prop up blood vessels over into our Goldilocks zone. Too many blood vessels, well, let's eat some foods that can actually mow down those extra blood vessels. The wonderful thing about foods is that you cannot overdo the system. So you can't shut down blood vessels with food so that you starve your heart, for example. You can do it with drugs. So the same drugs that you're treating cancer or at macular degeneration, we can actually, I mean, drugs are so powerful, we can actually overshoot if we're not careful, all right? That's why the dose of the drug becomes really important. Foods just take us right into that, you know, we can, helps us land that plane safely each time right into the zone. What do you think it is? Well, about assuming, our, our... assuming, of course, they're healthy foods, right? I mean, exactly. a good part of your book is talking about unhealthy foods, um, perhaps, David, yeah, what, you had a point to make. Yeah, I wanted. To, what do you think it is about our our changing environmental factors or diet that has led to the dysregulation of angiogenesis in our body? What what is the? Yeah, I mean, listen, it's, it's it's a really really great thing. So what are the, let's let's first take a step back and look at what's going on in our environment right now, right? I mean, so the three of us, we get up in the morning, take a shower, get dressed, go to work. You know, it's another day for us, and we go and and before long, we're back in bed, right? For the next reloading for the next day. But along the way, think about all the things that are happening to the environment around us on both the planetary level as well as the individual level. Things that we don't know about. For example, you go out into a bright sunny day and you've got ultraviolet radiation. You don't have to be in a suntan booth, nor do you have to burn and get sunburned on the beach to get ultraviolet radiation damage to our sun. You just start stripping away the ozone layer. Now the ultraviolet radiation is even more intense. Okay, that causes DNA damage, which which our body tries to defend against, but that can um, uh, disrupt our, our protection of our own genetic code of our DNA. Here are some other things that are actually um, uh, put us off uh, tilt. If you happen to still drive a fuel, uh, uh, a gasoline fueled car, as opposed to an electric vehicle, guess what? The gasoline, you know, I always ask people, do you stand upwind or downwind of the, of the filling pump when you're filling up your car? People look at me and they're like, uh, I don't know. Why do you even ask? And I said, if you can smell the fumes of the gas when you're pumping gas, okay, um, uh, it means that you're inhaling solvents that get into your lung that damage your DNA and tip you off balance. I always stand up with, okay. And, and so like people go, oh my gosh, I never even thought about that. What about when you actually go to your basement? Okay. Um, radon seeps up from planet earth and actually irradiates us nukes us from our from the soles of our feet upwards all right so again these are kind of um uh planetary forces that are around us but now let's add the diet sodas and the 10 teaspoons of added sugar to a regular soda let's add some uh synthetic chemicals that are preservatives that don't belong in ultra that don't belong in real food but are present in the boxes or cans or bottles of ultra processed foods that are everywhere in the middle aisle of the grocery store Let's take a look at the, um, uh, the too much alcohol. You know, uh, you know, recent research has come out to show that, you know, although it's been said that red wine, you know, drinking a little red wine is good for you. As it turns out, it has nothing to do with the alcohol. Same thing has been said of beer. I mean, there is some data that show that, you know, people who have moderate, modest consumption of wine and beer have some health benefits, but the research now shows that it has zero to do with the alcohol content. It has to do with the, the grape skins and the hops, and they release some of good stuff into the fluid, but you know, the alcohol has nothing to do with it. So 
again, a, a very I, sad message there, Dr. Lee. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but, but I think you're absolutely correct on that, uh, that moderate alcohol consumption is a bit of a myth. Right. Well, you know, a couple of other things that are, you know, like kind of the good news part of this, and besides the microplastics, I mean, you've probably heard about the recent research showing that, you know, we can even discover now microplastics in our, in human blood, which is incredible that we would have, you know, we you hear about plastic in the ocean, right? You know, uh, uh, plastic killing the turtles and messing with the old coral reef. And now we can find it in our bloodstream. I mean, these are forever chemicals that our body's not going to be able to get rid of. That's really frightening. Um, listen, the, the, the good news though, is that, you know, the first step to redemption is really awareness. Now that we're beginning to uh, understand this stuff, we now need to figure out how to avoid them, how to take care of our planet and our environment and our communities, frankly, better, how to take care of our families better, how to make better decisions. And so, you know, I always tell people, look, here's something really simple that you can do. If you use Tupperware or plasticware um, to store your food for leftovers at home, please change those over to glass. You can, you can have a plastic top, but don't store the whole right. thing in plastic. You got a water bottle, okay? Um, please make it metal, okay? Something that's inert to the water. It's not gonna shed plastic. Those plastic water bottles, they are they almost all contain microparticles you can't get rid of in your body. Although, what of course, is, metal gets into topics like BPA and what's lining the metal. So it's a whole, whole other story. Et cetera. But I mean, it's, look, I mean, we, we can't glass be is, <laughs> Aside from breaking, glass is probably the best thing to use. Yeah, oh. precisely. What, what do you think of the argument that you hear in the... Um, uh, some circles online, uh, you know, they call it the carnivore community where they're critical of the amount of uh, vegetables that people are recommended to eat because of the oxalates, the lectins, the, the phytic acid, the different uh, things that basically plants don't want to be eaten and they don't have the ability to run away. So they have, you know, they put anti-nutrients in their stems and leaves to to deter people from over consuming them. That's why they've survived over the years. It's kind of a general yeah, from yeah you know, I, you know, I, I think it's important to be really fair and to use science to make an argument. And I think that this is where the, the this is kind of one of the challenges, I think, of working in the food and health space is it's so easy to focus on the negative. It's so easy to actually almost take a religious view or a team sports view. You know, I'm going to back this point of view and everything else is an enemy. And it's really, life isn't that way. It's really, life is more moderate. More, life is more intermingled. It's never one simple black and white answer to things. Look, I mean, all the research that has been out there has shown the, the, the bot main body of research that eating more plant-based foods, whole plant-based foods um, is better for you, period. And, you know, um, and eating meat and seafood, it's okay. Actually, it's not, there's no, there's no devil in eating uh, meat uh, carnivores, but at the same time, you know, eating too much of that, again, we talk about abundance, right? Like just one of the things when you've got too much of anything and no limitations, that's when it's easy to make bad choices and too much of red meat, not good for you. Too much of ultra processed meats, processed meats and ultra processed foods, not good for you. Um, um, so the, the reality is, is that, and I read about this in my book, you could be disease that when it comes to food and health, it's not just about the food, it's about how our body responds to what you put into it. You put something um, uh, bad into it, your body's gonna respond badly, if poorly. If you actually put something um, uh, good in it, your body's gonna respond differently. And so, uh, and it's a matter of gradation, how much you do. Even something good in excess can become harmful to you, right? Even water, I mean, you can yes. have water toxicity. I have a old post on my blog about a grandmother in, New York, who poisoned herself with bok choy. She was eating several kilograms of nothing but bok choy every day. <laughs> and there are toxins in bok choy. And if you eat enough of it, you can cause them to build up and put you into a coma, as she did to herself. I, I had a, but that I doesn't had mean a, that one shouldn't eat bok choy. It just says you shouldn't eat nothing but bok choy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Listen, I, I had a, um, I had a, uh, a colleague, somebody I knew in college, who uh, loved garlic. And he went to every garlic festival. He smelled of garlic. He reeked of garlic. And, and it was his thing. And I knew going back way back when that, you know, I told him, I said, you know, like if you're eating like three whole cloves of garlic, like, I mean, like well, heads of garlic, not cloves every right. single day, um, you know, you're going to damage something at some point. Well, I, I read 
a few years ago that he had died of kidney failure because the garlic had actually knocked out all of his nephrons, the filters, filtering part of his kidney. And that's one of the things- Oh, terrible. Too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. A little bit of garlic, including black garlic, as I write about, can actually help boost your immune system. So again, if right. life, life is really about, I mean, the best place to stay is center of the road, moderation, even, you know, be even moderate with moderation. But I mean, so you can, you can cheat and be a little like go out, go all out once in a while. But most of the time, if you're, if you are middle of the road and modest and moderate with what you do, you're going to be fine. So here's the thing though, about plants. And I want to just kind of close a loop on something that David mentioned as an example. Look, um, plants actually have Mother Nature's put a ton of these natural chemicals called bioactives in plants or phytochemicals or flavanols, um, lectins, you name it. And most and many of the most powerful uh, bioactives in, in, uh, in nature, in our food, in our plant-based foods, actually do protect the plant. So that's accurate. What do they do? They, they protect the reproductive uh, uh, advantages of the plant. So uh, lycopene is red. Uh, anthocyanins blue and purple. They attract pollinators, bees and moths and flies and wasps to come to, to pollinate the plant so that they can survive. It's a survival instinct. Some of them like catechins and green tea um, uh, and some other bioactives, um, uh, chlorogenic acid and coffee. Those are natural insecticides or natural pesticides that the plant makes. And what happens, and this is an interesting thing for you, for you guys to know about, is uh, um, I used to be very skeptical about organic like, you know, show me, why do I want to pay more money for less toxins? toxins? Like, it didn't seem right to me. It was, it was a kind of a turnoff, to be honest with you. Show me the evidence. Well, now what we know is something different. It turns out that these natural pesticides, chlorogenic acid and, and catechins and tea, they're what the plant produces when little bugs nibble on the leaves and the stems, okay? And when the plants feel this nibbling from insects, they respond to those injuries by making more natural bioactives like chlorogenic acid, like um, catechins. And so turns out the plants that produce the foods that we might eat or drink that are grown organically, where, natural in, where nature is allowing those bugs to nibble on them. Plants might not look quite as pretty, but actually it, they're loaded with a lot more of these bioactives that are beneficial to our health. Um, there's more in organic than in conventionally grown. You take pesticides, not only to kind of destroy the land, the topsoil with those pesticides, um, uh, not only putting some of the pesticides in what we might eat into our body, but you're also lowering the pests, disrupting the ecosystem. So then the plant doesn't feel quite as much of that nibbling, it makes less bioactives. These bioactives do protect the plant, but when humans, you know, um, even when we were dragging our knuckles and we started to eat plant-based foods, those bioactives that once served the plant have another job description, and that is they interact with our human cells. Many of those plant bioactives activate our body's health defense systems to make us stronger, more resilient, more capable of defending our health against the damages from the environment. Very good. In interesting. Um, yeah, that's, I feel the same way that you do about uh, organics. Um, I've kind of come to the conclusion that sometimes you can taste the difference. And I think when you taste, when you can taste the difference, you know, your body has a fairly well-developed system to react to foods and detect what are good and bad foods. Um, and if they actually do taste better, that's probably a pretty good indication that they are better. Um, that's an interesting point. So let's talk a little bit about your, or maybe more than a little bit about your dietary prog, uh, prescription. Um, you, it sounds like you have a, you know, obviously you're advocating a lot, eating a lot of plants, but it's not a vegan diet. Um, you just mentioned, for instance, the Ornish study in your book, which was he's, he is a vegan and is advocating a vegan diet, but you seem to, again, you know, adopt a more balanced view for the most part. Um, can you describe what your basic prescription is? No Twinkies, yeah. I'm presuming, what or only that? rarely as a treat. <laughs> well, look, I mean, look, I, I'm first of all. Let me tell you where this is coming from. I'm 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 somebody that really enjoys food, and I really respect, and I take great delight. It brings me joy to uh, to to have flavors that um, delight my palate, and I love to try new things. 
And I love to explore cultures. You know, there's so many food cultures that go back hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years, where, you know, um, you can go to traditional families and villages and towns and, and find these recipes that you can actually cook yourself, many of them at home. And so that's kind of who I am. I've always been that way. I grew up in really like enjoying the tasting and the adventure of food. But I also really enjoy health and I also really enjoy science. And for me, what, what kind of my approach to food and what I recommend to people is to use that divining rod of science to point in the right direction, which foods have those bioactives that active that act active act in our body to uh, stimulate our health defenses. So first, let me talk, tell you what our what research has discovered our, our body uses to defend us against cancer and heart disease and macular degeneration and diabetes and obesity and Alzheimer's disease. We have, we have five health defense systems inside our body. They're hardwired. They form when we were in our mom's womb and when we were spanked on, out of the womb, took our first breath, our health defenses were kicked on and they, they fight. There are swashbucklers um, to protect our health all the way into our last breath. And these are angiogenesis, which we started talking about, the highways and byways to bring our blood and blood flow and everything in the blood to our cells, healthy things. Number two, our stem cells. Turns out that our body regenerates us from the inside out continuously. That's why our hair grows back, our skin grows back, our gut grows back, but you know, we actually can regenerate our organs as well. If you had a surgeon remove two thirds of your liver, the remaining one third would grow the rest of the liver back, okay? If you actually clipped off the top of your lung, it would actually completely grow back, quite remarkable. And our nerves, if you damage although, your nerve, your nerve. Although, although of course there are, you know, the heart doesn't grow back, sadly. You have a fascinating little anecdote in your book about, fetal stem cells helping a mother mouse to regrow her heart. That doesn't sadly happen in humans, well, at so least we'll, as far as we know. Yeah, well, so, well, actually, so the heart can regenerate. I'm involved with an effort. I've been involved for the last decade with an effort to actually use human uh, uh, progenitor cells, is what we call them, to inject them to the heart, to regrow parts of the heart. It does work. It doesn't work reliably yet. You know, sort of not ready for prime time, but it works. And I can tell you as a scientist- Fascinating super promising. Um, uh, you can regenerate parts of the brain, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, not ready for prime time. And uh, there's actually some cases now where you can take um, uh, young people who are unfortunately have uh, accidents and they uh, damage their spinal cord and they're paralyzed, quadriplegia. And you can deliver their own stem cells from their body fat and inject them. This is all clinical trials, early, not yet ready for prime time. And we can actually regenerate their spinal cord and get them to move again. Quite remarkable, but not ready for prime time. But my point is the body has this capability. Um, it's, it's a repair mechanism. Our gut microbiome, healthy gut bacteria, another bit defense, our DNA protects itself against the environment um, and against age, cellular aging and our immune system, which is both inflammation and fighting off viruses and bacteria and cancer inside are these are our five health defense systems angiogenesis stem cells microbiome dna and our immunity so what knowing that and now you all now you all know this the fact of the matter is what foods can you eat that activate one or more of these five health defense systems and that's basically where i write about more than 200 foods most of which are used in recipes from traditional food cultures asia middle east Mediterranean, Latin American cuisines, tomatoes, tree nuts, cashews, pine nuts, olive oil, seafood of various types. You know, so again, I follow the science. I don't follow any kind of, um, what's the right word? Uh, any partisanship, anti-meat, anti-vegetable. I, I just follow the science and I call a shoe a shoe, you know, and a winner a winner. Uh, uh, and so, uh, I write about all these foods and now with my next book, I'm writing even more. It's really uh, it's very exciting. I can't wait for uh, my next book to come out and to talk about this stuff. Um, uh, the next book is really also not just about boosting your health, but actually taking it to the next level by improving your metabolism uh, mm -hmm. and, and fighting body fat, harmful body fat. There's, these foods can actually do it. And so what I try to do yep. is make it boil it way down. What's that was one part I missed in, I didn't see in your book was a section on mitochondrial health. I presume you're going to be getting into that. In your uh, new book. So, yeah. So, you know, again, <laughs> mitochondrial health is a, like a connected to metabolism. And it's another one of those topics like 
angiogenesis and stem cells. You can, you can go a mile deep into just one topic. I mean, some people say, you know, the secret to aging is just your mitochondria. Not that simple. There's a lot of different components right. to it. Uh, nor is it your metabolism, nor is it angiogenesis. So, you know, like, I think we have to take a, uh, 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 be able to uh, have a screen in front of us that we are able to actually tell a, a convincing evidence based story that can, that has human evidence that can, can, can benefit us. So the key thing uh, is that I try to boil it down for a plan. I call it the five by five by five plan, three fives. What do these, what do they mean? Well, you got, our body has five health defense systems. Okay. Just remember, you want to choose foods that activate all of them over the course of the day. When would you do this? Well, on average, we encounter um, food about five times a day, breakfast, lunch, dinner. And most of us have a couple of snacks, maybe one in the morning, one, maybe one in the evening, maybe one after dinner, you know, those are about five things. So each of those five opportunities is an opportunity to choose at least one food that's going to actually uh, uh, address your health defenses. And so that's five health defenses, five, um, uh, five uh, uh, times that we encounter food, and just pick at least five foods that activate one of those health defenses. And if you just get my book and look at all the tables and columns, what I tell people to do, open up the book, take a, use your cell phone to take a picture of the lists of foods. Oh, actually, before you do that, open up my book, get a Sharpie, circle all the foods that you love, and you'd be surprised at how many foods that are in there that are healthy, health defense activating, actually you already love to eat, take a photograph of those. When you go shopping, when you're trying to plan, do meal planning, just open up your cell phone and check out which ones you've circled already. And then you just choose those and you, it becomes a no brainer. You've made it easy for yourself. You do it enough times, it becomes second nature. That's what I recommend. That, that leads me to a question from a listener that wanted to ask you in your book, you talk about angiogenesis foods and anti-angiogenesis foods. Angiogenesis foods. Um, uh, why are some of the foods listed in both categories? You know, ah, amazing. Good point. <laughs> Good question there. Well, here's here's the thing. Think about the Goldilocks zone as that perfect zone where we want to be. Can oscillate inside it. Um, what's a good example of a Goldilocks zone that, that people might know? Again, if you have ever been to a warm water uh, area where like a beach like in Florida or the Caribbean, you go into the beach and, and you know that when the water gets deep enough, um, the water gets cold. But up in the surface, there's like a layer, a zone. You know, it might be a, maybe six inches. It might be a feet, a foot where the temperature is pretty warm and you kind of want to stay in that. And that's what our body wants to do. And that's what foods can help us do. These foods that I write about can help us stay in a zone. Some of the foods can help warm up the water from below. Okay. And so you can grow more blood vessels for angiogenesis. Some of them, actually the water is a little too hot at the top and it'll cool it down. So that's uh, another example I give besides water would be like a lawn. You got to, you have a, you're, you're mowing your lawn. Some areas are bald patches. You need to put some grass seed in there to grow them up. Okay, but then if they grow too high, patches grow too high, what do you do? You take a lawnmower and you mow them flat back down to that perfect level on your lawn. And that basically, by the way, that's what happens in a golf course. And it's perfect or, you know, uh, the, 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 the grass is all the same length all the time. That's what our body does. That's what food does. Some foods will mow the lawn from the top. Some foods are like the grass seed to grow it up from the bottom. Some foods can do both. They're both the lawnmower and the grass seed but they still keep things right in that zone. And so this is part of really the, I think the marvelous nature of mother nature itself and part of the biology that our body already tries to get there and foods can just kind of tip us and keep that balance going. I think that idea of the balance is super, super important. It's like when you're riding a bike, you know, uh, you pay close attention to your balance. That's kind of how we should be approaching our meals. You want to stay, you don't want to fall off that bike. Here's another question that kind of mm -hmm. falls into that category of balance and how this works. Uh, someone asked about the, you know, someone who has heart issues or ED who would fall under the category of having insufficient angiogenesis. Could they eat dark chocolate, olive oil, pistachio nuts, et cetera, which you've listed as anti, uh, anti angiogenic foods, but may be healthy for these particular heart health conditions. Well, it turns out that some of those foods that you just mentioned, including dark chocolate and some tree nuts, for example, they can do both. They actually have both uh, capacities. Um, 
you talk about ED, erectile dysfunction, um, the, the, the treatments for those that doctors write prescriptions for actually um, are good for our blood vessels. They cause our blood vessels to widen. We call that vasodilation. When it comes to erectile dysfunction, that makes sense. Widen blood vessels, more blood flow, more what you want, okay, uh, for erectile dysfunction. Uh, but how it actually happens is that there, the, the, the medicines which foods can do as well, certain foods, um, uh, cause the body to make something called nitric oxide, NO. Nitric oxide is not nitrous oxide, which is laughing gas. Nit you know, the dentist gives you that. Nitric oxide actually is a vasodilator, dilates your blood vessels. It's what uh, medicines like Viagra and others, um, Cialis actually do. But it turns out quite remarkably, mother nature has its, her own way of doing that. And it has to do with nitrogen, nitric oxide, nitrogen. So it turns out that there that certain foods that grow low to the ground, okay, uh, spinach, beets, bok choy, they have a lot of nitrogen from the soil that they pick up uh, that, that's actually in the parts that we eat. So obviously you want to wash off the soil, but when you cook um, uh, spinach or beets uh, or bok choy, one of the things that you're doing is you're actually chewing it and you're eating the natural soil nitrogen that got absorbed into the plant. Here's the cool part. I remember I told you your gut microbiome, healthy bacteria are part of your health defenses. Well, our gut starts in our mouth, so starting in our tongue, all right? And our tongue has its own healthy ecosystem of bacteria. When you have beet, beets or spinach um, or bok choy and you chew it and you chew it to the point that you can enjoy the flavors, the gut bacteria on your tongue, the tongue microbiome actually interacts with that nitrogen in the spinach or beets or bok choy and changes the nitrogen into a form when you swallow it is absorbed in your stomach as nitric oxide. And so you can actually measure the blood pressure, the widening or constricting or the widening of the blood vessels in somebody who's eaten a, a, a spinach or had some beet juice or had a, some beets in her salad uh, uh, or bok choy. It actually, after a meal, after serving your blood pressure, the top number systolic blood pressure goes down a little bit and it stays down for a couple of hours. And so that's because of the nitric oxide that's happening. Here's a, here's a little tip for, for your listener. It's because it's based on your bacteria in your tongue. You have to really allow the tongue's bacteria to be exposed to the food long enough that do its job. So what your mother said, chew your food, don't wolf it. <laughs> makes all the sense in the word, world. It's amazing how much of medicine comes back to what your mother told you to do. Exactly. Now that's uh, Viagra sildenafil is the... Uh, trade name for it, not the marketing name, what to the point of sort of your profession in your book, what I found really fascinating about that particular drug is that it's not only beneficial, beneficial for erectile dysfunction, it's beneficial for heart disease, it's beneficial for PCOS. Um, I believe they've even tried it in age-related macular degeneration. And the fact that a drug like that has effects all over the body suggests that it is treating some systemic problem and not just erectile dysfunction. I think that's one of the best arguments that there's that a lot of these things, if I may, that we describe as separate diseases aren't really separate diseases. They're all aspects of a common process that's going on. Do you think that's yeah, no, fair to say? That's exactly the case. And that's really what I, you know, that's was sort of the game that I brought to the table when I started my medical research career, I wanted to look at what were the common denominators of health and disease, rather than do what medical research does. And this is what I studied for at the beginning of my career. You take, you know, one topic and you um, bite off it and then you go a, a tiny little topic, you go a mile deep on that topic and you ignore everything else. That's what medical research does. And yet, you know, we, we kind of know that in, at least in the human body, everything's connected. So I was more interested in looking at what makes the diseases connected. What, what, what are their common features? Um, one of my professors, my mentors uh, once said, if you drain the Pacific Ocean, you will see how all the islands are interconnected. And that was what I was really interested in is seeing, you know, how is Australia connected to Hawaii? Like that was, in, that's, that's interesting to me. Right. And, and, and from an economy of scale perspective, I mean, think about how much effort we, we invest to treating one particular disease. Imagine if we could find 
common denominators like angiogenesis, which is with the success that I've had in my career, where angiogenesis is the common denominator, problems with angiogenesis is the common denominator of 70 different diseases. Now you can pull the bow back and send a single arrow through multiple conditions at the same time. And the experience that you just described with Viagra is very similar. All of those conditions that you discussed, PCOS, macular degeneration, erectile dysfunction, uh, cardiac disease, they are all linked by the circulation, uh, the blood vessels, uh, angiogenesis. I'll, I'll add one more kind of um, uh, 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 piece of evidence to your to the pile that you just uh, started to, to build up. There was a study recently from the Cleveland Clinic that looked at um, 11 million uh, medical records from patients that they were in their system. And they looked at all the diseases that were difficult and looked at all the medications that these people are taking. In 11 million people, there was, there was a 1,600 different medications, 1,600 different medications. And they used artificial intelligence to go back and forth and back and forth to compare to see, were there any correlations between any of these medicines to really have a lower risk of any of these diseases? So again, it's kind of a sorting that, you, that the human brain can't do very efficiently. Mm -hmm. What they found was remarkable. They found that there was one um, uh, 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 disease that had a marked decrease in the 30% range, um, which was Alzheimer's disease. And it was connected to people taking a medicine that was not intended for Alzheimer's, which was? Sildenafil. Okay. Yeah. Sildenafil. And what's really remarkable is then to think about that, my gosh, they were not, definitely not being prescribed sildenafil for, um, um, for Alzheimer's disease. And we only discovered this in retrospect. So that's one of the um, shortcomings of this kind of research is that it's looking backwards. But the advantage is now we can actually say, well, maybe that's because the sildenafil was widening the blood vessels, making better blood flow to the brain. The nitric oxide was calling out the stem cells. They're also repairing some of the damaged neurons in the brain. Maybe that's what's going on. Can we go back to the lab and study this you know, properly? Can we run clinical trials on this? And that's the that's the path forward, the golden path for science. The yellow brick road is that's how we follow it down. Well, sildenafil, part of the mechanism seems to be in between, before it affects nitric oxide, it's affecting, it's protecting against oxidative stress, which is another term you use in your book a couple of times, which is another common theme underlying a lot of these diseases is excess oxidative stress. Um, do you want to touch on that at all or? Yeah, well, look, I mean, so um, oxidative stress is a concept that you can't see. It's a, I mean, it's an event you can't see. So people have a hard time sort of uh, uh, trying to put their, wrap their arms around. I do, you know, kind of a lot of education. So I'm trying to get people to understand things in, in, in easy ways. Oxidative stress is basically, if you shrink yourself like the miniature man, like there was like a movie back in I think the 60s, the the Isaac Asimov. Incredible voyage, right? Yes. So basically, people great get, movie. <laughs> you know, the kids, but basically, you get into the body and you can, and you're at the level of the cells. And what you see is that your cells, which become human sized, um, are, can, can be relaxed. Okay. Like widening blood vessels is relaxing, chilling. They also, cells can also be stressed. And, and, and we know what it's like to be stressed. Um, uh, it's, it's not very comfortable when we're feeling stressed. But take a, take a cell, imagine a cell is like a balloon that you blow up, like at a birthday party. It, you blow up a balloon, you tie it shut. Now, now you hold that balloon in your hands and you hold it in a gentle way. The balloon is not stressed. That's your cell, okay? Oxidative stress is like you hold that balloon and now you squeeze that balloon. That balloon is now stressed. That can happen in your body as well. And when cells are stressed, they don't use their energy efficiently. They're using it to, to fight off the stress. It ages the cell uh, prematurely. It compromises the, the pathways of chemicals that they're trying to produce for your health. And it, it really diverts a lot of attention away. Uh, and at, at, at its extreme, that's like squeezing as hard as you can. What's gonna happen to that balloon? It's gonna pop, you're gonna destroy the cell. And oxidative stress, at the tiny, tiniest level inside your body is like hands around your cells creating the stress. These are chemical hands. They're not like physical hands. So then, and you can't see them, right. but that's the analogy. And so um, foods that actually can reduce <clears throat> oxidative stress, which would be like antioxidant foods, vitamin C, uh, many of the sulforaphanes and brassica, 
um, broccoli sprouts, cauliflower, kale, cabbage, they can actually help to lower and calm uh, 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 our oxidative stress. So can um, uh, citrus fruits, the vitamin C and orange juice, but other foods have vitamin C besides OJ, strawberries, guava, um, uh, uh, red bell peppers, all great sources of vitamin C. And are there any foods that you think increase it? Oh my gosh. You know, probably more, more there. When it comes to oxidative stress, I would say probably if you go into the middle aisle of the grocery store, close your eyes, put a blindfold on and pick out any box. Okay. Uh, that you feel probably will increase <laughs> oxidative stress. I don't think, and, and the reason That's I'm saying a great that, answer. I, I don't think that you need to, I don't think I need to pick a particular offender. I think there are so many ultra processed foods that are combined, you know, that, that actually have combined so many chemicals that do cause oxidative stress. Now go back and imagine, you know, not one, not two hands squeezing a one, uh, a, a birthday balloon. Then I'll think about thousands of hands squeezing lots of balloons. And that's basically, you know, in part, uh, David, what you were asking about, like, why are we so unhealthy these days? And, and what has happened to us is that the more we, um, I would say, uh, follow the marketing that conditions our minds to buy things that seem like they might taste good, um, that, you know, are just basically sales tactics uh, that are highly machined, that your grandmother wouldn't recognize as food, that when you look at the ingredients, it's got like 20 ingredients and most of it you can't pronounce. That's the definition of all sort of processed foods. Um, uh, and, and, and that's really where you get into the risk of oxidative stress. Another okay, so then, question from uh, Florida as which foods would really help a person with Hodgkin's lymphoma? Would you recommend flavonoids or bioactives as very helpful for this kind of disease? Yeah. Okay. So, well, for non-Hodgkin's or Hodgkin's lymphoma? Which Hodgkin's one? lymphoma. They have. Okay. Those. All right. Well, look, so um, I can't give medical advice. And so um, I'm going to sort of answer the question more broadly, which is that if you were to take a look at uh, cancer and look at the so-called liquid cancers like Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, leukemia, multiple myeloma, those are the so-called liquid cancers. They're different from colon, brain, breast, uh, pancreatic cancer, those are solid tumors. So the liquid cancers, um, you know, they also have some really great treatments that are coming out. The fact of the matter is, is that the same principles, you activate your body's health defenses to defend you against the cancer. Can you eat foods that are um, more anti-angiogenic? I have those in my book. Yes, because um, Hodgkin's lymphoma, cancer cells also require blood supply to feed them where they live. Uh, what about stem cells? Can you target cancer stem cells? Absolutely. There are foods that can help wipe out the harmful stem cells of cancers that help them keep coming back. What about the gut microbiome? This is one of the most exciting areas. Um, there, was, there have been papers published recently showing that even if you're getting the most sophisticated cancer treatments available today, that's called immunotherapy. This was published in the journal Science a couple of months ago. Um, only 20% of people respond the way that we hope that they respond. And it turns out the reason that they respond has to do with bacteria in their gut, one of them called ruminococcus. And to grow that one bacteria, they looked at what people were eating. And it turned out it was things with dietary fiber. And how much dietary fiber? About five grams of dietary fiber per day lowered mortality by 30%, okay? Um, this is, and it was quite remarkable. And so how much, is, how much would that be? a medium-sized pear has about five grams of dietary fiber. And so again, what we eat can influence our gut bacteria. Antioxidant foods lower the damage from chemotherapy and other targeted therapies for liquid tumors that are out there and solid tumors too. We want to have those that will help your body's DNA to protection. Then what about your immune system? This, when it comes to cancer, is something that really is on fire as a area of promise. If you can actually get your immune system going to the degree that your, your, our bodies were designed to, our immune system can wipe out cancer. That's why we don't get cancer more often. Our immune system continuously wiping out those microscopic tumors we talked about earlier in the program. And, and so immunotherapy, which won the Nobel Prize, the, the, the development of the science uh, leading to this won the Nobel Prize in uh, 2018, we can actually figure out a way how to turn on our immune system and send them out like bloodhounds to go search out and destroy uh, cancer cells. 
that actually benefited my own mother. I've had many patients who um, had cancer rip growing through their body. Okay. 10 years ago it would have been game over. All right. And with immunotherapy, which you need good gut, healthy gut bacteria to, to work. Um, actually the, the treatments, or I should say the person's own immune system prompted by the treatments completely wiped out the cancer, including tumors that had spread to the brain. So things that I never thought I would see in my career, my medical career are happening today. What we need to be able to do is to understand the role of diet and lifestyle on how to make these treatments work better. And that's where food is a new tool in the toolbox. Interesting. Now, one of the other treatments that's been shown to be fairly effective in some types of um, cancers, which you touch on in your book, is a ketogenic diet. Yet at the same time in your book, in your book, you caution against the high fat diet. Now, typically a ketogenic diet is a high fat diet. How do we reconcile those two areas of caution? I have my own ideas about how we do that, but I'm curious to hear what you, what, what your opinion is and what you've seen in the research that uh, leads you to think that they're, you know, what, why is the, why does that seem to be beneficial in some circumstances and harmful in other circumstances? Right. right. Okay. Well, let's kind of separate things uh, out into their component parts. Keto making ketones in the body is a way that our body is hardwired to survive when there's not enough nutrient nutrition around. All right. So we're, if you're, if we're, if we're marooned on a desert Island and we can't find food, eventually our bodies will actually make ketones because our brain really needs energy in order to be able to actually keep functioning. So ketosis, which is the process of making lots of ketones is something that our body is going to do depending on its fed state or unfed state as that may be. You can also create ketones by the way, by um, as, as I was alluding to by not eating. So intermittent fasting or fasting will also create ketones. You don't, you don't need fat. You don't need to eat a ton of high fat food in order to create ketones. Right. Just don't eat less. Isn't it true that Can newborns you... like to be in ketosis? They preferentially prefer that or? No, I mean, I just think that um, it's, it's, as we go through development, we wind up having periods between meals where our bodies might make more ketones. And I will tell you that when I was a medical student, the f first time I learned about ketones as a medical student, it was always in the setting of diabetes. Ketoacidosis. If you, if, you, if you actually are in a diabetic crisis, your body's not getting the fuel that even though you're eating food, it's not, re it's not reading it. It's not receiving it. The fuel's not being stored. It'll go into a crisis because it doesn't have fuel. It'll create ketones as part of this natural on a desert island survival mode to, to create fuel for your brain. And so it'll pump out ketones. Too much ketones will shut your body down as well. Of, and so, of course, that's a dysregulation state, ketoacidosis. It's very different from ketosis as uh, a normal well, physiological it's a, it's a, process. Well, let's put it this way. Ketosis is all part of physiology. Ketoacidosis is an extreme. Keto, you can, right. if, if you were to pursue a ketotic diet to its extreme, you will go into ketoacidosis. Okay. So that's, really? oh, oh yeah. I mean, so, and then, so now let's, so let's, so let's, that's physiology. Okay. That's how the body is wired to work. Um, and, and if you cycle through that, do intermittent fasting, you know, you can uh, uh, cut out carbs, all these different, you'll, you'll kind of get, you'll get into, um, develop mild ketones in your body, more ketones in your body, more ketones in your body. You can take it to an absolute extreme. And just like the garlic we talked about or the bok choy, you can fall off the cliff on that. On the other hand, the ketogenic diet or, you know, uh, as the keto diet is a mm -hmm. pop approach. It's really people that really want to take some of the science and figure out how to create a program, structure program that is uh, going to help your body create more ketones. It's not the medical, it's not the physiological. It's a, it's a, it's a pop diet. Does it work? Kind of works. Um, is it um, healthy? Uh, you know, I think that anything that goes into an extreme, eat lots of fat, probably not, you might, you might be healthy in one way, but you're probably, again, the body wants balance. You're probably going to tip the balance in another part of your body. You won't, you might not realize it for a few years. It might even be real, recognized for a decade. And so what I try to tell people is that, uh, you know, uh, I, I have no problem with people trying these popular diets, these fad diets. Um, but, you know, honestly, the most valuable thing you can do is to get onto a dietary path that is reasonable, that's based on science, 
that doesn't take you into extreme in either direction and is really aligned with your own food tastes and your preferences. Because if you're going to be able to do this and sustain something over a long period of time, and that's really what you want to do with food, it takes years and years and years of practice to be perfect really for using food and health. There's no quick fix. And I think that that's where a lot of these pop popular diets are just trying to do a quick fix in three weeks, change your life around completely, you know, lose this much belly fat. And, you know, it's, it's marketing like anything else. I think all, I always tell people, I, you know, um, I know cancer patients. Uh, I actually can help to convene a, a whole conference, a cancer research conference, looking at ketogenic diets, which apparently have some pretty phenomenal benefits uh, in, 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 along with regular treatments for brain cancers, glioblastoma is quite remarkable, um, right. really stunningly uh, uh, beneficial. Look, I mean, you, you can't argue with, um, uh, with results that you're seeing. Uh, so uh, there's something there for sure. I just think that, you know, to basically say, and this is what humans were designed to do, uh, I, I would say, you know, humans are designed to kind of drive in the middle of the road, not at the, at the, at the gravelly borders. Have right. you looked at yeah, any of the anthropological research about what humans originally ate in there? And they you know, I know there's a lot of speculation in that field. You know, I, I, I've only read about it probably um, as much as you have as well. I'm interested in the history, you know, and I think that it, number one, uh, it's hard to really go back that far because food substances, other than the seedlings and some of the other hard, non-degradable um, things don't survive over tens of thousands of years. But, you know, I, and of course, you know, you hear that humans really didn't eat meat and they were, you know, if you talk to the plant-based community, humans basically scrapped along and looked for plants and leaves because it was too hard to catch animals. Um, and then you talk to the carnivores and you hear, they listen to what they're saying. They're saying, now, nah, you know, like we hunted woolly mammoth and we hung up strips of meat and cured and had our jerky for a year. There, there are no cave paintings of broccoli. That's the <laughs> that, oh, Yeah, okay. That, yeah, we, we have, yeah, exactly. That's, that's a good one. Now, on the other hand, you know, here's the other, and I'm just saying this um, in the spirit of just sort of trying to say that, you know, between these extremes of, of portrayal and narrative is probably the truth is somewhere in the middle. <clears throat> um, you know, as it turns out, humans at one point, it wasn't just us walking this earth. There were like four other types of humans that all lived at the same time. Some of them were big, like Neanderthals. Some of them were tiny, like the Denisovians, okay, that they were found in Siberia, the bones and caves that we found them. And guess what? In human caves, in their fire pits where they cook and they carve, and they in the in the in the uh, in the um, recycling bins uh, that they had, so to speak, in their caves. Guess what they found in our caves, human caves? They found the cut, chipped bones of the other humans. So it's <laughs> well suspected that we ate meat, but not only woolly mammoths. Humans ate the other humans and killed them off. The other white right? meat, yeah, pork meat, right? The other white meat. <laughs> the other white <laughs> yeah. Meat. <laughs> so anyway, my point is. It's a narrative and, you know, and we're not 10,000 years old. We live in a society that is, has got a lot of modern benefits. And I think we should um, be grateful of those modern benefits. We should take advantage of them. But we should also realize that with innovation and with engineering and, and all the progr pro human progress that has been made, including factory farming and all that other stuff and creating that abundance um, at the individual level um, and at, at the community level, we have the ability now to have the, I mean, humans do have awareness and we have the ability to integrate information into knowledge with awareness. We can actually make better choices. Do you like, uh, do you recommend organ meat like liver and things like that? You know, I am not personally a fan of organ meat, although I have eaten it before. Um, it's just not something that's very appealing to me. Uh, so I, I don't although know would... nutritionally you recommend oysters, which are <laughs> organ meats effectively. Yeah, you're eating the whole like, organism. Yeah, I mean, once you once you go down that, you know, like the tail meat of the lobster is, you know, it's butt, I suppose. So, you know, the, <laughs> the, so I mean, the the fact of the matter is, is that um, I, I suppose muscle is an organ. So if you eat a steak, it's also an organ. It, it depends on what you know how you want to parse those words. 
but I think what you're talking about, David, is, you know, um, spleen, pancreas, thymus, liver, you know, um, do I recommend yeah. that from a medical perspective? You know, not, not really. I think that, you know, uh, if, if you prefer that, sure, look for a preparation that you enjoy. They have some beneficial minerals to them. Um, uh, but I, I, I don't sort of try to prescribe that um, simply because you can usually find other alternatives that are not organ meats. Well, well, Dr. Lee, I really appreciate your time. It's been a, a really wide ranging discussion, very informative. Uh, I hope you don't mind how many different uh, rabbit trails we took, but it's all part of our learning it's, process it, here. It was well, my, my pleasure. And you know, the, the fact is that, you know, I wrote Eat to Beat Disease, really that, I mean, it's a pretty thick book, but I, I wrote it um, to, to try to bring together as much information as I could at one time that could be useful. Uh, and really is also not only to tell interesting stories and to bring the science, but also to have a reference around, but there's so much information. And one of the things that I- um, We didn't even get into any of the recipes you have towards the end of the book. And, they, and they're all based on my foodie preferences, things that taste really great. But one of the things that I realized, you know, over the last couple of years during the pandemic, when we were at the very beginning locked down, not knowing what to do. And here I was a medical doctor realizing we didn't have enough information about what was happening there were no pharmaceuticals, no vaccines. The hospitals didn't know what to do. Doctors didn't know what to do. I realized when I was staring out the window along with every other human on the planet that we still needed to eat. So um, making those decisions completely when the medical community had no knowledge, no options, no solutions, it made me realize that something that I could contribute was teaching free masterclasses using you know, a virtual medium. And that's what I've been doing now. So I encourage anybody who wants to hear more wide ranging facts, new research is coming out. I, I can't tell you like the amount of, like I'm drinking out of a fire hose every single night on new research that's coming out on food and health. I do these free masterclasses and if people want to sign up for them, I encourage them to do it. Come to my website, it's Dr. Dr. William Lee, L -I .com, Dr. William Lee .com. You can sign up for a masterclass, get on my newsletter. And the point is that I, I have a mission in life, which is to really get out information that people can use, because unlike the work I've done in biotechnology, where it could take a decade to come up with a new cancer treatment or a new treatment for macular degeneration, what I say about food, what we hear about food, that's evidence-based, you can translate into your own action right afterwards. And that's right. uh, the immediacy is something that I'm very passionate about. What, what success look like to you when it's all said and done? What do you want to see as your... Impact. You know, uh, I would say, I mean, it depends on what angle, but I, one thing that I am, I mean, I will tell you something that I'm on a mission to try to change. I want the medical community, the MD community, not alternative medicine, not just integrative medicine, not chiropractors, not nutritionists, but MDs like myself that are not trained in nutrition. I want the entire community to realize that pharmaceuticals with a pH which is what we're taught, is only one part of our toolbox, but that there is pharmaceuticals with an F. This is our food as medicine. That is a really important part that has been completely missing from our education. I would call success if we could get other doctors like me. You know, I'm talking to my peers as much as I can to educate doctors, that the same science that you use to learn how drugs work can be used to understand how food works. And that is the field of food as medicine. And when I can get other doctors to have the kind of conversation we're having now um, uh, about food and medicine, I mean, look, this conversation is perfect like example. Here we are talking about drugs, talking about diseases, talking about health, talking about food. This is the kind of conversation that we've had today that a physician group, a group of physicians should be able to have, um, whether it's in a cafeteria or a classroom or on vacation. And that's just not the conversation that doctors have today. So success to me will be getting the medical community up their game to recognize that food is an important tool in the toolbox for health. Amen to that. Yeah, I completely good. agree with that. And check out drwilliamlee.com and to join Dr. Lee's masterclass. It sounds very exciting. Yeah. And I will say I enjoyed your book very much. Uh, there may have been a couple of points that I disagreed with, but all in all, it is a terrific book and one that I think anybody could benefit from reading and following. Well, thank you. And I, I'm very impressed, uh, uh, Tucker, with your fluency on some pretty complex uh, terminology and concepts. So it's great to be able to have this conversation. Thank it you. was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.